It's not necessary to have a lot of room or even elaborate vegetable or flower beds to enjoy gardening. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. What if I told you that even if you lived in an apartment that didn't have a balcony or a terrace, that you could still enjoy gardening and have beautiful vines, exotic plants, and even fruit trees? Well, it's all true, thanks to houseplants. If you approach gardening with houseplants with an open mind and a sense of adventure, you'll find there's a whole world of creative possibilities to take advantage of. Today, we'll take a look at an old favorite vining houseplant, and I'll show you the best way to propagate this plant from cuttings. Then I'll introduce you to a commercial grower who produces thousands of plants using a similar process, and then uses those vines to create fascinating topiaries that would add elegance to any home. We'll learn how one orchid grower is using both high-tech and time-honored methods to preserve endangered varieties of these beautiful plants. And then I'll give you some tips on how to care for your own orchids, as well as another interesting blooming tropical, the bromeliad. And finally, after a specialty grower in California gives us a tour of his vast array of fantastic-looking succulents, I'll show you a couple of useful plants I think you just might like to have around your home albeit for different reasons. And throughout the show, I'll be sharing with you tips on watering, humidity, and using houseplants for purifying the air in your home. So don't go away. Everyone's looking for that ultimate house plant, one that's virtually indestructible. Well, this is about as close as you can get. It's pothos. It's very popular because it's so versatile. Now, when I say versatile, I mean in terms of the conditions it can take. This plant can take full bright sun or a dark room, and when it comes to humidity, it's not fussy at all. Even though it's a vine, it can be kept under control, making it useful in a variety of places in the home. To help maintain its compact form, every month or so I have to cut off these long runners. This makes the plant look thicker and fuller, and it also allows me to take these cuttings and make new plants. It's really simple. To make a cutting, all you have to do is find a leaf joint, and you can see the roots are already beginning to grow. Now, I'll cut it just behind the leaf like this, and now it's just a matter of placing it in a jar of water, and in a few weeks it'll be fully rooted. Before I place the cutting in water, I remove a few of the lower leaves. The interesting thing about this plant is it will thrive in water, but once it takes root, you can just put it in some basic potting soil. Pothos has another name. It's called Devil's Ivy because it will literally grow like the devil. Vines can offer a unique and whimsical look like few other plants. And what's interesting to me is that you can take a common everyday plant like English Ivy and transform it into some fantastic shapes for our homes and gardens. That's exactly what they do here at Schubert's Nursery in Salinas, California. Mike Fagel, the president of Schubert's, recently gave me a tour of their operation. Walk me through the process in creating topiary. Well, we propagate all our own uh, cuttings to get our own plants. And so from that point, which takes between six weeks and two months, uh, it then moves into another greenhouse where it is spaced and is allowed to grow and once it's reached the proper size we'll train it onto a wire frame, whatever one that is, and generally speaking the ivy then needs to get fixed two to three more times before the plant is ready to sell. Well Mike, I'm sure that these topiary are very popular at Christmas. Yes, it is our busiest time of the year and I would like to say that it was a complete madhouse around here, but uh, we're so well organized that we managed to keep all everything under control. Well, not everyone can say that about That's Christmas, right. I'll tell you. <laughs> These are wonderful. Yes, this is a very popular item. It's a new one for us, and uh, 
it did very well last Christmas, and it does well during the rest of the year because it can be used for many, sure. many locations. But it has that classic Christmas tree shade. Right. Well, you produce a beautiful product. Well, thank you. And thank you for taking the time to show us around today. Oh, no problem. It's always nice to see you. Thank you. Ivy isn't the only plant that they use to make topiary here at Schubert's. Herbs like rosemary, lavender, thyme, and scented geranium make attractive and fragrant topiaries ideal for the kitchen window. And they also use other vining plants that grow well indoors. I always enjoy discovering new and interesting plants. Now here's a house plant that's definitely on the climb, both in terms of its popularity and the way it grows. It's a vigorous climbing vine. Its formal name is Mullenbeckia, but I think it's easier to remember it by its common name, wire vine. It's because of these tiny wire-like stems it gets its name, or you may find it called angel vine. I guess it's because it's so light and delicate. Usually plants that look like this can be fussy, but don't let its appearance fool you. This little guy is tough and is a rapid grower. In fact, all of the plants in this entire greenhouse started just last year from one plant. Angel vine is a native to the Mediterranean region, so it's accustomed to hot, dry conditions. I think that's why it's so ideally suited to our homes, because particularly in the winter, the air can become hot and dry. It can also withstand the caretaker who forgets to water it from time to time. In milder climates, this plant is an evergreen vine that can grow outdoors reaching lengths of 20 to 30 feet. That's why it's so well suited for growing on wire frames like this indoors. It's easily trained into a variety of shapes and forms, and since it has a tendency to sprawl, you can keep it in check simply by giving it an occasional haircut. There are three easy ways to raise the humidity for your house plants. First, if they don't have fuzzy foliage, you can simply mist them with a fine spray of water. A method I prefer is to set the plant in a dish of gravel and add water to the dish. As the water evaporates, it will bathe the plant in moisture. And if you need to raise the humidity in an entire room, these little humidifiers are ideal. Orchids are undoubtedly some of the most fantastic of all flowers. One can't help but marvel at their beauty and design. Many species literally live in trees in their native environments, while others can be found growing in the soil. There are over 35,000 species of orchids across the world, making them a huge family of plants. As you might expect, in a world where our natural environment is becoming all too fast replaced with paving and parking decks, Many of these orchids have become endangered. Terry Root at the Orchid Zone takes conservation of orchids seriously. He maintains thousands of varieties, of which several dozen are endangered. While growing orchids is his business and his love, he is also committed to protecting them. The greatest uh, threat to orchids is habitat destruction. Uh, and we grow some here that we believe to be uh, totally extinct in nature. And if it weren't for operations like this, they'd no longer exist at all. No telling how many haven't been discovered yet. This is one right here that was discovered in 1984. And prior to that time, it wasn't known in cultivation at all. And we've been mass producing this one for the last uh, number of years and produce these by the thousands, so it's no longer a rare item. We perpetuate the orchids by making a selection of the traits we want to uh, perpetuate. We make the pollination and that uh, seed develops on the plant over a period of a year. And we take it to the laboratory and put it in a sterile bottle of agar. After a few months and it germinates, we transfer it to another flask where it has more space to develop. And after about a year in there, it comes out and it's a greenhouse plant. Such delicate beauty that we can enjoy in our homes during the winter. It's all thanks to breeders like Terry. Without them, they wouldn't be available to us. If you're like me, caring for something this delicate can be intimidating. But orchids are surprising little creatures. They can be some of the easiest and most beautiful houseplants to grow. 
With such a large family, it's probably no surprise that some orchids are easier to grow than others, like the Thalonopsis or the Lady Slipper orchid. Both of these are ideal for growing in the home environment, whereas the Cattleya orchid is a little fussier. It prefers a greenhouse environment. The reason Phalaenopsis and lady slippers are favorite house plants is they'll take low light conditions. And when it comes to temperature, if you're comfortable, they are too. Orchids really don't grow in soil at all. They grow in the bark of fir trees. And some growers like to create a blend of 50-50 fir bark and lava rock. Orchids are light eaters. You only need to fertilize them with 25% of the recommended amount on a liquid fertilizer label and they should be fed about every other week. Orchids hate salt buildup from fertilizer, so it's important to wash that out when you water. A bloom that'll last up to three months, now that's hard to beat in a house plant. Here's a house plant that comes about as close as any I know to adapting to the tough conditions of our homes low light, low humidity, and dry air make it unbearable for many plants, but not the bromeliads. In their native habitat, they can grow with very little root system on tree branches, trunks, and on rocks. That's why a large plant can grow in such a small container. With so few roots, you might guess a plant like this wouldn't require much water. Well, you're right. In fact, overwatering is the number one cause of death of bromeliads in our homes. You see, too much moisture around the roots will cause them to rot. But this plant has other ways of storing moisture. You see, these leaves overlap to create cups, which actually hold water. When it comes to fertilizer, very little is necessary. A diluted solution, say down to 25% of an all-purpose houseplant fertilizer, is all you need for plenty of vigorous growth. Just feed them every two weeks or so. If your bromeliad hasn't bloomed in a while, there's a way you can trick it into flowering by simply using a plastic bag and an apple. Make sure there's no stored water in the leaf cups and cover the plant with a clear plastic bag along with an apple. 10 days with the ripening apple will be long enough to encourage the plant to begin producing a flower stalk. Of course, my favorite member of the bromeliad family is one we've all seen, and I like it for obvious reasons. It's the pineapple. Some plants are just downright fascinating, like succulents. Now, if you think the name is strange, you ought to take a look at some of them. They look like they came from someone's vivid imagination or another planet. Robin Stockwell, the owner of Succulent Gardens in Carmel, California, provides a wide variety of these unusual plants to his customers. Robin, why do all these plants look like they're from Mars? Well, mainly because they've had to adapt to rough environments in which water was not available. You have a, a group of plants that oftentimes are completely unrelated in the plant world, but because of drought or frozen uh, water or salty water, the plants have over a period of time adapted so that they can store water long periods of time and they become kind of thick, juicy uh, plants. And, and have the ability to store that water for long periods. Little that, water storage vessels. That's right. Yeah. I do feel that succulents are becoming more popular. People are on the go all the time. They're not home all the time. They're living in smaller spaces. Sometimes our lifestyle means that a plant has to be able to live in a harsh environment because we're, we're not there to take care of it. And so small spaces, apartments, little patios, small planters, succulents are ideally suited to this kind of an environment. If you look at these plants, there's just lots of color, lots mm -hmm. of variety. People need to really get out there and just dig in, put them in the soil, have fun with them, use all of the principles they've used with the plants in their garden. Just use their imagination. Have a good time. Yeah. Many people say they'd love to garden, but they just don't have the time. Come on, even someone with the busiest of schedules can grow a garden this size, as long as it's full of succulents.
Here's a succulent most of us recognize. This is the aloe vera plant, and it's a plant no kitchen should be without. It's a nice enough looking house plant, but the main reason for keeping one of these things around is because of its healing properties. You see, you could also call this the first aid plant. It's developed quite a reputation for itself in soothing minor burns, scrapes, and other irritations. I always keep one nearby, so if I burn my hand or finger, I can just break off one of the stalks and squeeze the gel directly onto my skin. You can feel the relief immediately. Aloe vera is one of the easiest plants you'll ever grow. It likes plenty of light. It's ideal for a sunny kitchen window, and it prefers to stay on the dry side, so there's no need to fuss over this plant. You've probably seen the many products out there containing aloe vera, everything from shampoo to hand cream and even pills. But there's some question as to whether aloe vera can actually maintain its healing properties once it's been processed and stored. Some studies indicate that it actually works better when it's fresh, which is all the reason I need to keep one of these little guys around. Another positive aspect about this plant is the gel contains both antibacterial and antifungal properties. Now there's a lot of work being currently done on aloe vera, and it'll be interesting to see what benefits researchers unearth in the future. But until then, it's just nice to have this friend around. Succulents, which come from the arid parts of the world, are well suited to the low humidity and dry air of our homes. Tropicals, on the other hand, like humid, moist environments, and some tropicals can be just as welcome in the kitchen as aloe, but for different reasons. Fruit-producing tropicals, like members of the citrus family, can make excellent houseplants. About the only disadvantage to growing them is many of them can get too large and cumbersome for inside. This lime tree in a few years will have to find a new home. That's why I like this little plant. This is the Calamondin orange. It's actually a little miniature orange tree that rarely exceeds 30 inches in height. This plant is actually very easy to care for. When it comes to growing conditions, it prefers at least four hours of sunlight a day. And for moisture, you don't want the roots to dry out completely, but never let them sit in water. It's best just to keep the soil consistently moist. This Calamondin orange has been grown as a single trunk, but I'd like one with a broader canopy. So I'm gonna begin pruning this young plant where it has three principal trunks. The way to do this is to simply choose the strongest trunks and remove all of the smaller secondary limbs from them up to a certain height. As you can see, I've removed about a third of the foliage from the bottom part of the plant. Now occasionally, Calamondin orange can have a problem with scale, mealybug, and spider mite. So I spray any infested plants thoroughly with an insecticidal soap. Between the blooms and the fruit, which can take almost a year to ripen, there always seems to be something interesting going on with this plant. The next time you go on vacation, if you don't have a neighbor who can water your house plants, here's a tip to ensure they get plenty of moisture while you're away. Just place your plants in a child's wading pool with a little water in the bottom. Or if you can't keep them outside, put them in a bathtub with a couple of inches of water. If you don't have natural light in that room, make sure you leave the light on for them. All of us are interested in making our homes and offices more pleasant places to live and work, and it shouldn't be any surprise that house plants can help. Not only do they make a place look more attractive, they can actually help purify the air. NASA has concluded that living plants can make a big difference in our interior environments. Eight to 15 plants are really all you need for the average size house, and some plants are better air filters than others. Plants that work well include Chinese evergreen, English ivy, Dracaena marginata, and the corn plant. Well, we've certainly seen that the world of house plants is full of diversity and beauty. And best of all, we've only scratched the surface. There's literally a house plant out there for everyone. So whether you garden in an apartment or on 40 acres, the main thing to remember 
is that there's always room in any home for a little piece of the earth. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers, bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us, and every time the sun comes out, I can't help but smile. Oh. But small. 